saying this, that the purpose of the church is to bring glory to God. That is the only purpose of the church. Now, that doesn't mean that um, we, we don't do anything and so hope that God will be glorified. It means that we play an active role. There are certain things that we do that accomplish this goal that we have, and the goal is to bring glory to God. Uh, I've heard it preached and taught that there are purposes of the church, and we should be a purpose-driven church. I, I, I want to dispel those thoughts from your mind. We are to be a person-driven church, driven by and to the Lord Jesus Christ for the purpose of giving Him glory. And there are things that we do to accomplish that. Uh, two weeks ago, I, I started this little series, and the first one I spoke on was fellowship. We spoke about how fellowship, or this Greek word koinonia, uh, means oneness or a togetherness, and how we uh, would have a oneness or a togetherness, and how we accomplish that, and how God accomplishes that in us through the new birth, so that we are able to be in fellowship with each other and in fellowship with Christ, and it accomplishes the goal of bringing glory to God. Last week, I spoke about worship, and we dispelled the, the, the uh, misinformation uh, that worship is a, a service. You, know, you come to a worship service or uh, you go to uh, listen to worship music. Uh, life sacrificed unto the Lord, that is worship. Uh, worship is a lifestyle. It's not something you can turn on and you can turn off. Uh, worship is the way you speak with your spouse, the way you handle your children, the way you uh, do your taxes. Uh, it's almost tax time, remember? So it's the way you do your taxes. Uh, it, it is how you interact with people. It's the food you eat. It's the things you do. It's how you prioritize and schedule your life. Worship is a lifestyle of sacrifice. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices unto the Lord, for this is your reasonable, or uh, uh, other translation would have this word, spiritual act of worship. Worship. Worship is a lifestyle. Now, that does not do away with the fact that we have corporate worship when we come together and we raise our hearts and our hands and our voices and our minds and we are just... Um, raise ourselves up before the Lord. Yes, yes, we do that. Uh, but that is just a, a corporate coming together as an outflow of what we're already doing in our lives. Uh, I, I, I think sometimes the misunderstanding is that we can be out there in the world living like the world, get, ascribing worship to the world, living like the world, and then come here and worship God. Uh, it's just an overflow. And how we worship God through our day, through our week, through our month, through our lives, affects how we will worship corporately. It affects how we worship corporately. Worship is not an activity. Worship is a lifestyle of sacrifice, holy and acceptable before the Lord. And as we live this lifestyle of worship, or worship, giving worship to Him, so we achieve the goal of the church. God is glorified. When God looks down and He sees us living a life that's showing you are worthy, then He is glorified. Now, tonight, the third session, ministry. Ministry. I, I want to dispel some myths before we get to the Word. Ministry, uh, if you ask Google, for those of you who Google's your best friend, I ask uh, Google, is Google male or female? Has anyone figured that out? Siri, male or female? I don't know. So I just say, hey, okay, Google, define ministry. And Google will say to me, ministry, the occupation of a minister in a religious organization. Minister. A, um, a, a role played in a governmental uh, institution, and then rarely, uh, there's this word rare, 
It's rare to find it used in this way, um, meeting of someone's needs. So that's what Google says, and so uh, let me displace this all for you in saying this. Ministry is stewardship. I want you to grab hold of that. Ministry is stewardship of those that God has put in our path and that which God has entrusted to us. Ministry is stewardship. I've quoted this quote many times in this church, and I'm going to use it as a working example very quickly. Um, it's by Warren Wearsby. If you want to read a great book, I think I have an extra copy. If someone needs one after this, you can have it. I think I've got maybe two extra copies. You just come and tell me, and I'll give it to you afterwards. It's a book by Warren Wearsby called On Being a Servant. On Being a Servant. And he uses this as a working definition for what ministry is called. And he'll say this, ministry takes place when divine resources meet human needs through loving channels to the glory of God. Let me say that again. Ministry or stewardship takes place when there's a human need that is met through a loving channel by the divine resources of God so that God would be glorified. So I just did it backwards for you. Let me do it forwards again. Ministry takes place when divine resource meets human need through loving channels to the glory of God. At no time does the Bible ever call us to be producers of something. Whenever God demands something, he always provides it. Let's take salvation as a great example of this principle. Would you agree that righteousness is necessary for salvation? Jesus said, lest your righteousness exceed that of the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of God. And so we need righteousness. In other words, to be in right standing, purity, to be perfect, moral purity, to be able to enter heaven. And he doesn't leave us to try and figure that out ourselves or to do that ourselves. He says, only the righteous will enter the kingdom of God. And he sent his son to die and impute us with his righteousness that we might enter the kingdom of God. What God demanded, God provided through Christ. I want to take that a little bit further in saying this, that what God demands for salvation, that is righteousness, God also, what God demands for sanctification, ministry and service and worship and fellowship and discipleship, God provides for that through the Holy Spirit. He has provided for salvation through Christ, and now he provides for us to accomplish ministry, for us to accomplish discipleship, to accomplish worship and oneness and all of these things that we have spoken about and will speak about through the work of the Holy Spirit. He does not depend on us uh, to work something up to try and achieve his purposes. He has given us the gift, Christ in us, the hope of glory, to achieve that which he wants to do. I'm thankful, and that's a very freeing thing. Uh, Philippians 3 speaks specifically to this, and when he says to work out your salvation, not work for, but to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that it is he who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Isn't that awesome? That, that I don't have to be producing it, but I just have to be dispensing. I, I, I'm not a, 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 someone who has to make it. I'm just someone who has to dispense it. He's done it all. 
Uh, Christ has accomplished all things uh, through his righteous life, his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. And he has also now indwelt us, and we have the Spirit of God residing within us that we might now be conformed to Christ and live out the life that he has set before us. And some of the things we do in that fellowship, we live in fellowship, we live as worship offerings to him, and we live doing the ministry of Christ. We are the hands and feet of Christ. Wow, that sounds so spiritual, Anton. You, now we're just ready to go home. No, no, I, I want to put some feet to that. What does that look like practically? What does it look like practically? Well, come with me to a few scriptures. Uh, I've got a whole bunch, so uh, I hope you don't mind you reading the Bible, but I think it's best that I, I read scripture than give you my opinion. First, would you go with me to uh, Jesus giving us an object lesson? And it's found in Matthew chapter 25. And Jesus here is giving us an object lesson. Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. For it will be, now he's speaking about the kingdom of, of heaven, for it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. Now they're going to be ministers or stewards for him. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability when he went away. And he who received the five talents went at once and he traded with them and he made five talents more. So also he who had two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug it in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and he settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward bringing five talents more saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here. I have made five talents more. Would you say that that man was a good minister? Yep, a good steward, right? Remember, minister, we've dispelled that thought that it's a, a man who wears a tie and preaches from a Bible, or a man who holds your hand while you're about to die. That's not a minister. Now, that's some ministers do that, but every member of the body is a minister. If you've been born again, and you're part of the body, you're a hand, you're a foot, you're a nose, you're an arm, you're a, a toe, you're a finger, and you have a role to play, and that's that of being a minister. And so the master, he gave him five more. Verse 21 says, his master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little, I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had two talents came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents here. I have made two talents more. And his master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little, I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also had received the one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew that you're a hard man. You're reaping where you did not sow, and you gather where you scattered no seed. So in other words, he thought his master was unrighteous, unjust. So I was afraid, and I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what's yours. And his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reaped where I had not sown and gathered where I scattered no seed? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I would have received what was my own with interest. And so take this talent from him. Give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will be given, more will be given. And he will have abundance. But the one who has not, even what he has will be taken from him. And listen to this. Cast the, world, the worthless servant into the outer darkness in that place that there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So here we have three servants. Uh, two of them have been given talents. The one five, and he gives five more in proportion to what he received. 
One was given two, he gave two more in proportion to what he had received. The one who was given one gave nothing back, just what he had. He thought that the, the, the master was unjust. He proved not to be a steward or a servant of the God, and he's kicked out. I want to say to you that today that as stewards, as ministers within the, the kingdom of God, we have all been entrusted with something. And we are to be good ministers or good stewards of whatever that is. So to get more practical than that, to say that there is an accounting that will come one day, um, we need to go to some of the scriptures that will speak to that and how we can apply that to our lives. So I, the first place that I think of going to uh, would be uh, to uh, when Paul is teaching to the church in Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. Now, remember this church in Corinth, very sinful, and, and there's much division in the church. And, and Paul's going to address them, and he's going to say something very specific to them with regards to serving God, the ministry. Listen to what he says. So here's the, the argument. I'm following Paul. And someone says, no, I'm following Apollos. In other words, no, I'm following. And so they are breaking up and they're saying these people are more important. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, this is what he says. And I'm going to start reading to you from verse number 5. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants, ministers, Stewards, through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. Did you get that? Who did he assign to? Well, he assigned to Paulus and he assigned to Paul. Uh, he assigned to them each. I planted, said Paul, but Apollos watered. They had two different jobs they were doing. But God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. Notice this is not about salvation. This is about stewardship. This is about the talents, right? Five brought five, enter in, two brought two, enter in. Here he's saying, Apollos watered as Paul was throwing seed. Apollos was watering. God brought the growth, and each one will receive his reward accordingly. Each one playing their role. Each one being a worthy minister. So verse 7 says, So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one. Each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. We are God's fellow ministers, stewards. You are God's field, God's building. Now listen to what God has done. According to the grace of God given to me, says Paul, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation Someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care of how he builds upon it. You see what he's saying? He's saying, I'm not in, in isolation here. God has given me this job, and I'm putting my shoulder to, to, to the, the wheel. I am, I am doing the best I know to do. He is doing this work through me. It is him that's doing it because it's all about him. And, and, and you come and you do the best you know to do uh, as he does it through you. Because he has given to you according to his grace. Isn't that amazing? He has given to you according to his grace. Well, I don't want to do that. I'd rather do this. Well, I don't kind of like that. I like that. And the Lord's like, I've gifted you here. And this is where I need you to be. I've given you my grace here. And this is what I need you to do. He says, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus. 
It's all about Christ and what Christ has done. Now, verse 12 says, Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, or precious stones, that sounds like good building right there, right? But then in come the three little pigs. (laughs) Wood, hay, and straw. Each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through the fire. Now, that's typically where people will read to, and they'll stop there. But I think the key is found further down. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? That is an odd place to put that down. Why in the world do we go here from don't be divided, don't try to say Paul or Apollos, each one's got their job, God has given the grace, he's given each one their own ability, each one, you be careful on how you're going to, pl- go, how you're going to build on this foundation, how you're going to use your gift, and you know what, there's going to come a day when there will be a judgment, it's called the Bema Seat of Christ, when every believer will come before him, this is not for lost people, it's for saved people, they will come before Christ, all their works, everything that they did, will pass before him as through the fire, and that which is done for Christ, done with the motivation of bringing glory to God, that ministry, that will pass through as precious gold and uh, uh, preciousness, and there will be a great reward for that. But that which is hay and wood and stubble, that which was temporary, done for self, done because out of own effort, out of the ability to produce itself, that stuff's going to burn up. What happens to those believers that didn't depend on the next portion? Do you not know that the Holy Spirit's in your body? Well, according to the Scripture, they're not going to lose their salvation, right? It says their works will pass before. That which was not done for Christ, that's going to burn up. And that person still will be saved, but only as one passing through the fire. In other words, there will be no rewards for that person. Lakeler Baptist Church, every member is a minister of the grace of God in its manifest forms. We've not received the same gifts. We do not participate always in the same physical work, but we are always using the gifts from the giver by the power of the giver for the glory of the giver. Does this make sense? I want to say that again. We're not always busy in the same physical, practical work. But we are always participating in the same spiritual work by the power of the same one who's given the work, he's given the gift, and he's given the ability, and he's to be given the glory. Ministry takes place when divine resources through loving channels. In other words, those that have been born again, they have the Spirit of God residing within them, meet a human need for the glory of God. Is this making sense? If I had to stop right here and ask us in this room this question, how are you doing in ministry? What would your answer be? Wood, hay, stubble, precious stones, Gold, how are you doing? God's given you a gift. First gift that he's given you is the gift of himself. He's residing within you. And he is willing to will and to work according to his good pleasure. He is calling for one thing. And one thing only, and it's this, surrender. So you mean I don't have to do anything? No, that's the thing about surrender. Surrender says, thy will be done. Thy kingdom come. 
surrender says, I will do whatever you tell me. Not because I'm able, but because I know I'm not able. Not because I'm capable, but because I have an acute knowledge of my incapacity to be able to do this. But I trust you. For the righteous shall live by faith. It's stepping out and letting Christ be Christ in you. As you are conformed to Christ, as you allow Him to accomplish His will, He works it out in your life. It's just giving over to Him. And you say, well, that sounds pretty easy. If it did sound easy, that's not what I was trying to make it sound. Because it's really not very easy. Because we deal with a sinful nature. We, we deal with that, the old man. And it's difficult. But the bottom line is this, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. The bottom line is this, that he is able to do abundantly and exceedingly more than you could ever imagine. The question for us is this, do I want to participate with him? You see, the question is not imitation. The question is participation. We've heard it all along. You need to imitate Christ, imitate Christ, imitate Christ. The reality is the scripture calls us not to imitate Christ, but to participate with Christ. Let him live his life through you. Anyone can imitate someone on a television. Boy, I used to do that all the time. I used to love the Lone Ranger. Do you all remember the Lone Ranger? Man, I'm going to tell you, I loved the Lone Ranger. It was like awesomeness to me, you know? And you know what I liked about him the most? Nope. Nope. Not Tonto and not Silver. He was the Lone Ranger. I'm a loner. I'm a loner. You, you, leave me in my study. Leave me alone. I will be so good. I don't like people. Imagine that. And then the Lord says, I'm calling you to love my people. And to minister my word. And I say, so, I'm an introvert. I'm extremely conscious of myself. I don't know how to teach. I don't know anything. I have a terrible background. And you tell me, lead my people, feed my people, care for my people. And on top of that, you say, are you going to hold me accountable for their souls? Is there something wrong here? And the Lord says, I didn't ask if you're capable. This is the grace I've given to you. This is the gift I've given to you. And you need to submit yourself to my rule. Surrender yourself to my ability. Trust me for my capability. And you just say, I'm incapable and let me do the rest. And boy, am I doing a great job? Ha, ha, ha. See what I did right there? Try to make something funny that's really not funny at all. Because the reality is this. Whatever gift God's given to you is very important. And he's not going to come out of heaven and kick you and beat you until you do the job that he lays before you. All he does is he says, I want to do this through you. Would you surrender to me? You're a jar of clay, a weak, imperfect vessel. I got a whole new view on jars of clay just a little while ago in my life. I was speaking to someone that was selling pottery and uh, there was this amazing piece. And uh, this person said, well, it was supposed to be a jar or something. And I just couldn't get it like it was supposed to be. So I just smashed it with my fist. And boom. And it just looked like, and I was like, that's cool. I'm just going to fire that sucker and that's what it's going to be. And I thought to myself, in its imperfections, 
that was one of the things that drew my attention the most on that table. And it was nothing but a jar of clay, something imperfect, something that really didn't look like it had been planned because it had and it was just smashed with the fist. And that's the way it fell. But I'm thankful that God doesn't just smash us with a fist, but that he has formed us into the exact vessel that he wants us to be. Some may be a water pitcher. Others may be a basin. Others may be a plate. Whatever it may be, God has formed you to be what he wants you to be. And he has given you the ability to be that. Because he doesn't expect you to do it, he will do it. If you will just surrender to that. Do you not know that you are God's temple and God's spirit dwells in you? <laughs> That's a whole new picture, isn't it? All right, Paul, we've heard enough. What have you got to say, Peter? We've heard Jesus giving an example. We've heard Paul admonishing us to be good stewards because there's an accountability and there's a need for us and, and told us that the Holy Spirit can do this thing. Now, Peter, what do you have to say? So go to First Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4. You may, if you don't mind me replying, re repeating what you say. He went to hell. Th that's the point. Yeah. And, and that's the point. Uh, obviously, you cannot force the narrative or the, 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 the example to fit every character. But I think that the point that's being made here is those that are true servants of the master, they are the ones that are bringing forth fruit. But those that are not the true servants of the master, they don't bring forth any fruit. There's nothing there to show. In fact, even their view of the master shows that they have never submitted to the master. And so what is the spiritual application of that? I think the spiritual application of it is this, that there are those that will go to hell. A place where there's gnashing of teeth. Yeah, it's a terrible place. It's a place that, that we never want to go. And this is the glory of it all, that the servants of the master will never get kicked out of the house. You take the prodigal son. He was a son when he left, and he was a son when he got back. There are times when we wander off, but there's always the coming back, always the coming back, always the coming back. There's always going to be the fruit of righteousness, proof that we have submitted to the master. That man gave proof that he had never submitted to the master. You know, Jesus said, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord. And I will say to them, away from me, you workers of iniquity, for I know you not. And they will say, but Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we prophesy in your name? And the Lord will say to them, away from me, for I know you not. That's not even speaking about people who are like, Lord, you know, I know I was like in a drunk and an adulterer and a murderer, a gossip, uh, a slanderer. Uh, uh, uh. I understand that you say away from me. They're saying, oh, I'm religious. What are you talking about away from you? I've been working for you. The proof is this. That passage goes on to say, that they were not the ones that did the will of the Father. They were doing their own will. They were doing what they wanted to. Related back to the talents, the one with the one talent, he didn't do what the master said. He did what he willed, and he hid it away. It's a lost person. It's a great observation. 
Peter, speak to us, would you, on ministry, on stewardship. What did God give you as he inspired the scriptures? So in reality, it's really God. What are you saying? First uh, Peter chapter number 4, uh, and I want to read from verse 1, but I, I really... Let me do that. I'll read from verse 1, but I really want to speak on verses 11 and 12. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves the same way of thinking. For whenever, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. This is what he's saying. Don't, don't live for yourself. Live for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. Now, with respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. Now the, old, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Now verse 10 Here's the emphasis. As each has received a gift, as you and me, all believers, have received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards or ministers of God. Not just stewards of God, but of God's varied grace. What is he saying? He's saying this, each one of us has received a different gift, but it's still the gift of God's varied grace, or, or his much graceness, if you want, and we are to use it for one another's good. In other words, the gift that I've received, I believe my gifting is the gift of shepherding, uh, the gift of, uh, of preaching, teaching, I think that's kind of the, where, where my gifting lies. There are others that may have the uh, gifting of teaching and administration. Others have, ha, have a gifting of encouragement. Others have a gift of helps. There's all these various gifts that people have. They're all different. But you know where they came from? The same one. And, and you know who decided what you got? He did. You know who decided where you'd be placed in the body, whether you're a hand, an arm, or a leg? He decided. It's not a human decision. It's a decision that God has made. Your gift is something that God has given to you. I'm not speaking about talents. They are very talented people. Talents is something that you just got. You know, it's kind of like, well, I've always been good at this. I've always been good at that. No, 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 this is something that when the Spirit of God came upon you at the time of your regeneration, when you were born again and He deposited Himself in you, He gave you a specific gift. And that gift is to be used to serve others, not to serve yourself. I do this with my hands. I think I'm rapping, you know, it's like, <laughs> huh? That's crazy, isn't it? I need to tie my hands behind my back. Someone tell me that. Gosh. Whew. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Did you notice that? It's a gift and you're using it to serve others as stewards of your gift or of God's grace. Of God's grace. You have been given the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. 
when we see human need, it's because he has placed himself in us, because he has indwelt us, because with this indwelling, he has also gifted us individually that we can meet that human need, not because we're so great, but because he gave it. Divine resources, through loving channels, human needs, for the glory of God. So now he's going to mention some of these. As a good steward of God's various grace, whoever speaks, verse 11, as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves, as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. You stop here. Listen. God's not looking for producers. He says, those that speak, do not speak as your opinions. Do not speak about your imaginations. There's too much storytelling in the pulpits today. Speak the oracles of God. Speak the word of God. And then he says, those who serve, serve in his strength. How many of us are so dependent on our ability, our strength, our capabilities, our Man, we are just so limited, are we not? And for us to say, I got this. Don't worry, Lord, I got this. Right, you got this. See where that leads. That leads to wood, hay, and stubble. That leads to self-glorification. That leads to look what I did. But when we are speaking the oracles of God, uh, when we are serving uh, in the strength of God, there's something that happens. And here it is in the text. I'm not going to make it up for you. We're just going to read the text. Why do we do that? In order that in everything God may be glorified through you. No, no, no. Look. Through Jesus Christ. Well, wait a minute. God's glorified through me. Remember, I'm the one that submitted myself. I'm the one that surrendered myself. I'm the one that's trusting in his strength. I'm the one that's opening my mouth to speak the oracles of God. It's me. Oh, no, it's Christ in you. It's Christ in you. You wouldn't be doing those things for him if Christ was not enabling you. You'd not be able to speak the word of God if God were not doing it. It's all a work of God for the glory of God ministry is not something limited to someone who stands behind a pulpit or sits next to your hospital bed and prays with you as you're about to die. Ministry is something undertaken by every person in the body of Christ because they've been indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He has impregnated us with himself and he has given us a gift and he enables and propels us forward to be able to fulfill that for this purpose that we can never say look what I did look what I did it's all about what he's done and it's all about what he continues to do so here we end in this passage. He says, in order that in everything God may have glorified through Jesus Christ. And now it's as if he, he's wanting to drive that home to us. And he says, so to him, that is Christ, to, to God, belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. It's like he's driving it through to us, saying this, you have been given a gift, so serve others, not in your strength, not in your ability, not, not, not with your, your men mental capacity, not with your physical strength. You serve with the gift that God has given you by the power of the Spirit who resides in you, and Christ will be glorified, the Father will be glorified, and it's to Him that all glory belongs. We can never add anything to God, by the way. He is perfect. He has what's known as intrinsic glory. He is glory. 
It's what he is. You cannot add to him. You cannot take from him. It's just who he is. But there is something you can do. You can ascribe glory to him. It's the recognition of his glory. It's an affirmation of who he is. Not adding, we don't make him look good. You know, and, and hey, I say that a lot. You know, have you ever heard me say that in preaching? We need to make God look good. We need to, we need to put him on the center stage. We, we, you've heard anyone heard me say that? You never heard me say, put God on the center stage. You've never heard me say things like, uh, we need to lift him up and exalt him. Listen, no one lifts him up, no one exalts him. He's high and lifted up and wholly exalted. No one puts him on the center stage. He's on the center stage. And no one gives him glory. He is a glory. We just affirm that he's on the center stage. We affirm that he's high and lifted up. We affirm the fact that he is good. We don't make him look good. It's who he is. Ministers are stewards of God for the glory of God. For you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Every member at Lake Lure Baptist Church is a minister. Do not, I say it again, do not expect others in the body to do something that God has gifted and empowered you to do. You will be very unhappy. You will be living in disobedience. And God will not be glorified through you. Accept the reality that you have been born again into the family of God. You have been baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. You have been indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You have Christ in you, the hope of glory. He has gifted you with one of his many gifts of his very grace. And he will accomplish the ministry of that gift, all that he desires from you. It's not imitation, but participation. If you will participate with what Christ is doing, just say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Not always looking for the no buts. No but, but, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I heard it said just a, a while ago about a pastor who said the Christian life is not about saying no to sin, it's saying yes to the Lord. I don't agree with that. The scriptures, sorry, no to sin and yes to the Lord. I do not agree with that. The scripture says that we are to say no to ungodliness. We are to resist the evil one. And we are to be obedient to Christ. And so there is a personal responsibility to say no. There's a personal responsibility to say yes. But all of that ability lies in Christ. He enables me to say no. And he enables me to say yes, Lord. I have a choice. You have a choice. Are we going to participate with him? Or are we just going to sit back and not participate. A sign of a spiritful life is a continual participating with Christ. He's willing you to will and to work according to his good pleasure. For he who begun a good work in you will bring it to point of completion. It's all him. Nothing we can do. No works we have the privilege of participating in the good works that he has prepared in advance for us to do. That's Ephesians 2.10. May we be found faithful ministers for Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Father, I'm thankful.
for the time in which we've been able to study your word. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be faithful ministers for you. Help us to be the hands and feet of Christ. Lord, as I'm praying right now, the, the phrase incarnational ministry comes into my mind. And the wonder of Christ living through us to meet human needs for your glory. And so I pray today, please, Lord Jesus, strengthen us, live your life through us, make us obedient. Those times, Lord, when we are stiff-necked, I pray that you will not spare the rod, but Lord, that you would chastise us, because Lord, there's times when I'm just plain stiff-necked. There's times when I pay no attention to what you are doing. And I run ahead as a, a disobedient child. There's times, Lord, when I take circumstances and situations into my own hands, where times when I know I should be falling on my face before you and surrendering to you, and God, the flesh just flares up. And so, God, I pray you forgive me for those days of disobedience, those instances in which, Lord, I have not honored you. Those days, God, in which, to put it frankly, I am greatly embarrassed. Lord, we want you to continue to show up in the life of this church. God, I beg you tonight that you would manifest your presence in the life of my brothers and sisters. Lord, manifest your presence in my life. That when people see us and they see us participating with you, that they will see Jesus. God, that they will see that you're great. That they will know that you are the God who is absolutely sufficient. Sufficient not only for salvation, but even for sanctification, for stewardship, for everything we need. You are everything. So Lord, help us to always say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Regardless of the cost, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.